personality. I think many people would agree that Steven Universe can be a very unique, artistic show. While some people are split on the series, I'm personally in the category of enjoying it. And with the conclusion of the fifth season, and a Steven Universe movie, I feel the show has broken a lot of new ground. The show's offered a lot of discussion on various sensitive issues, has complex and fascinating main characters, and I personally just find it a pleasant experience to immerse myself in the Crystal Gem world. There's often an intensity in the raw emotion of this show that I very rarely see in other cartoons, and it often gives its message in a way that's a good combination of visual and verbal. But despite the writers mostly listening very closely to their viewers, the show has made its share of pretty stupid mistakes. But I think these episodes mostly come from experimentation, and just having a show with an extraordinarily large range of creative freedom. But these mistakes have certainly resulted in some annoying, boring, or just head-scratcher episodes that make you wonder what such a talented team was thinking. So let's look at the good and the bad in the top five best and worst Steven Universe episodes. But when it comes to Steven Universe, there's one person in particular who I consider a real expert on it. Hello, Strider. So you'd like a second opinion on these Steven Universe episodes? Ah, welcome, Leah. Absolutely. If you'd like to help, it'd be a pleasure to have your input. Sure. Even if we don't agree on every episode, I'll do my best to give you my opinion of what I think of them. I appreciate that, Leah. Thanks. Let's get started. For the fifth worst, Future Boy Zoltron. <sighs> Every now and then, a long-running series just has to make a forgettable episode. And this one's at the start of the list, because I don't think this episode is all bad. But jeebus is it a snorefest! Steven accidentally breaks an attraction called Zoltron, and has to work off the debt to Mr. Smiley. I agree this episode isn't terrible, but it also didn't need to exist. Other side episodes of the show tend to at least add something to the narrative and lore of the world, but this one doesn't really do that other than reveal some of Mr. Smiley's, albeit boring, backstory and introduce Mr. Frowny, who isn't even a character we've seen in more than one episode. And this brings us to what I consider the show's biggest weak point. It's minor human characters. I find Smiley an unpleasant, often passive-aggressive character. Uh, Mr. Smiley! Mr. Smiley! Hey, don't break character! You broke enough things today! And he never comes off as funny or entertaining to me at all. Generally, he's just awkward to watch. And that's the problem with a lot of the jokes in this episode. I don't mind an episode of Steven just hanging out in town, but practically every single joke makes me feel awkward and uncomfortable. Do you know how expensive this machine was? It, it was an accident. <laughs> I mean, did this episode contribute anything? Well, it does at least show that Garnet's future vision can be lent in real time to someone for long periods of time, but something similar was already shown back in Jailbreak when Garnet showed Steven how to find Pearl and Amethyst. If the point of this episode was to show that Garnet could temporarily transfer her powers, episodes like Winter Forecast and Future Vision already did it better. In my opinion, Future Boy Zoltron is a rare misstep for this show. And to be fair, they kind of made up for this episode in the previous episode. Speaking of which... Zoltron sees sadness in your future. And for the fifth best... Mindful Education. I think something Steven Universe excels at is the way it interweaves life lessons into its episodes. And in my opinion, few episodes show this better than Mindful Education. It deals with Connie excessively ruminating on her mistakes and trying to run from her thoughts. It's an episode that resonates with a lot of people because of how it deals with intrusive thoughts and learning how to let go of them. While the episode also deals with anxiety and negative feelings around having done something bad, it also focuses on how we tend to dwell too long on our mistakes and shortcomings. Connie's example is perhaps a little less serious than some of her own life examples, but it does work fine to explain mindfulness. Connie is feeling horrible for accidentally hurting a classmate, and she ends up in a negative thought spiral. Whether a person is ruminating on black thoughts, or simply a mistake from the past like Connie, the method the episode teaches of accepting your thoughts and allowing the emotions the thoughts bring is incredibly valuable. And it's so important for dealing with fear, grief, regret, and ruminating thoughts. Because when you allow yourself to feel those emotions the thoughts bring, they can begin to lose some of their effect on you. To find balance, you must understand your feelings. To understand your feelings, you must see them clearly without running from them. 
It's okay to feel bad about things and accept that you've made a mistake, but it's also important to realize that one mistake isn't the end of the world. If a person acknowledges the hurt and pain they've caused themselves and others, they will be better able to move past it. The line, take a moment to ask yourself if this is how we fall apart, is such a life-saving line because it reminds you to stop and think that if what you're worried about is really as big of a deal as what you're making it up to be in your mind. Well said, Leah. I agree. On the more practical side of things, the way the episode portrays Stephen and Connie's thoughts made me feel like I was right there in their heads. I really felt like I understood Connie and Stephen's pain, and the animation played a big role in that. The color scheme and visuals are simply stunning for capturing the emotional feelings in a unique style. Take a moment to think of just flexibility, love, and try. Mindful Education is a beautiful, valuable episode that captures the characters' personal struggles, while perhaps even encouraging viewers to be more mindful of their own thought processes. I spent all that time feeling bad instead of doing something. It's like I was trying not to think about it, and that just made it worse. And for the fourth worst... Island Adventure. Now, Lars improved tremendously as the series progressed, and we'll discuss him more later, but this particular episode certainly shows why it took viewers so long to warm up to him. The episode's about Steven warping himself, Lars, and Sadie to a beach, and, uh, accidentally getting stranded. And it feels like almost every single piece of dialogue from Lars is constant whining. At this point in the show, I really was starting to wonder why Steven and Sadie even bother putting up with him. But on the plus side, the song Wherever You Are is one of the better Steven Universe songs. In fact, it even made it to Gem and my best Steven Universe songs list. It's soothing, it's catchy, and it's down to earth. I can agree that, beyond the song, this episode is pretty forgettable. While in my opinion there was obvious romantic implications between the two before this episode, I don't really think trapping these three on an island was the best way to go about it. Steven playing matchmaker with Lars and Sadie fits his naive personality at this point in time, and at the very least, that was good. Yeah, true. Steven does fit his character at the time pretty well. But Lars's constant moaning and groaning really wears on my patience, and Sadie's, uh, methods of wooing Lars seem less than healthy. You see, it's revealed that Sadie purposely stranded them there, because apparently she was trying to help Lars by giving him a vacation? I don't know, that action has always fallen kind of into the creepy category for me, and it seems out of character for a down-to-earth character like Sadie. She was trying to get herself and Lars together, but frankly, it was extremely slimy for Sadie to strand everyone there just for her own gratification. While I could see Sadie's frustration in not being able to help Lars, it really just comes across as her being possessed and pushy. People need to want help in order to change, and for Sadie to force it on him wasn't the best way to go about this. It would have been better if the invisible gem monster were to have cracked the warp pad when they first arrived, or have guarded it shortly after their arrival. Then the rest of the episode could have played out normally. As is, it just makes Sadie's character into an over-possessive individual who's trying to force unwanted help onto Lars. You were just gonna leave, but I knew how much you really needed this! Why don't you ever let me help you? Even the whole Player 2 thing rubs me the wrong way. You're the best Player 2! Personally, I don't think in a healthy relationship you're just someone's player too. I think sometimes you should be player one as well. While they take a lot of measures to rectify the issues from this episode later, at this point, Sadie and Lars' relationship feels pretty unhealthy, and not one I'd personally be trying to encourage to a younger audience. And for the fourth best, change your mind. While this isn't confirmed to be the series finale, particularly after the movie. I'm not quite sure what more they can do, because all the loose ends are pretty much tied up in this episode. The title alone is a great hint to what the episode is going to center around. Many people consider the show offering a representation for various non-conventional and LBGTQ identities, and this episode tackles that in a very straightforward yet creative way. The gems and diamonds being controlled by White Diamond are given black and white color schemes, which is a great representation of someone having a black and white mindset and forcing their beliefs onto others. The reveal of who Steven's gem actually is beautifully represents being born a certain way. Though honestly, I do feel like White Diamond did come around a little too easily, and I personally would have liked to see the show better acknowledge that some people will not be open to change or introspection. That was one of my main issues too. The supposed redemption of White Diamond felt rushed, and I feel she should have put up more of a fight. I feel ridiculous. Yellow. Blue. <gasps> She's off. 
color. But I do think all of the symbolism and the way that White Diamond controlled or bleached the gems was excellently portrayed. As far as the main plot lines go, it did basically wrap up the series in a bow while still leaving room for the story to continue beyond this point. Yeah, I guess there are directions they could go after this episode, as the movie demonstrated. But these points aside, there's a real sense of epic and scoped this episode that we rarely see, and seeing Obsidian's transformation was one hell of a thrill. There's an intensity, atmosphere, fast pace, and epicness to this finale that captures much of the spirit of the show. They're huge! And the third worst Steven Universe episode is... Rock Naldo. An episode centered around Ronaldo already feels like a repeated mistake by the writers, yet alone an episode that features him joining the Crystal Gems and annoying them constantly by being obnoxious and stuck up. Uh-uh, no. You are not living here. I mean, I do understand having an episode that focuses more on being funny, and every now and then, the show does make a good, more comedy-focused episode. But to me, this episode did nothing but show off how intolerable Ronaldo can be. I think for most people, this episode will either be too annoying, as Ronaldo's whining gets old very quickly, or too boring, because Ronaldo joining the Crystal Gems doesn't lead to anything but more of him whining. Nothing actually progresses here. Ronaldo is a character that doesn't really bother me personally, but I understand why this episode is one of the ones infamous for being widely disliked. Ronaldo was in character for the episode and was as wacky and weird as usual, but it's one of those episodes that for sure added nothing to the real value of the overall story, other than pushing the narrative that Ronaldo is weird, which we already knew. I don't think most people are bothered by Ronaldo being weird though. Being weird is awesome. I'm personally very proud to be weird. What I think people are annoyed about by Ronaldo is how obnoxious and self-centered he was, even when Steven offered kindness to him. The whole episode, it feels like Ronaldo's manipulating Steven's kindness. Nothing Ronaldo did felt like it was coming from a place of companionship or interest. Well, I can see where you're coming from. I think episodes like Keep Beach City Weird, Rising Tides and Crashing Skies, and Watermelon Steven do a much better job at demonstrating Ronaldo's quirkiness anyway. The only good thing I found about this episode was Pearl constantly mispronouncing Ronaldo's name and in general showing how much she still doesn't understand humans. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, Blood Fry. We also can't forget the meme-worthy expression that this episode graced us with. Was there anything you liked about the episode, Strider? Parts I liked? Well, I did think the way Steven told Ronaldo off was pretty satisfying. Perhaps the message behind this episode is that you can't help everyone? Which is actually a very profound, important message that I've mostly only heard Bojack touch upon. You have to stop yourself, because there are some people you can't save. Because those people will thrash and struggle and try to take you down with them. You think he'll be okay? You worried about him enough, Steven. And for the third best, Mr. Greg. This is perhaps one of the series' most mature episodes, as it touches on a handful of very real, raw, emotional topics. It's about Greg becoming rich after one of his songs has turned into a burger jam. And I know in my gut it's been worth the 595. And now I'm filthy, stinking rich. And he offers to take Stephen and Pearl on vacation to Empire City. And let's bring Pearl. Well, he offers Steven, and uh, Steven pushes Pearl to come along. The episode highlights how Pearl wants to move on from Rose, but she has no idea how, and she's frustrated that she can't. Steven, realizing that Greg and Pearl would be invaluable to one another's recoveries, decides that this is the perfect opportunity to try and mend their relationship. Both love me and I love both of you. While many Steven Universe episodes have one good song, Mr. Greg is loaded with good songs, all of which have their own unique sense of style and help set up the next scene perfectly. But to me, Pearl's song, It's Over, Isn't It, steals the spotlight of the episode. It's over, isn't it? Why can't I move on? Pearl's resentment of Greg was something that we always kind of knew was there. However, this song shows just how much pain Pearl has been holding on to. It made me sympathize with both these characters, because I like both of them. And I can see how much of this is just life. Love triangles happen, loss happens, and sometimes it can be very hard to let go of the things or the people we love. 
but eventually Pearl and Greg are able to break through their barriers and even dance together. Pearl and Greg dancing seems to be their way of fusing, similar to how Greg and Rose fused back in the episode We Need to Talk. It's a very good way to show that they're beginning to push aside their feud and help each other to heal. And it's worth noting that all of this is done within 11 freaking minutes. I mean, talk about taking advantage of every single second you have. In my opinion, Mr. Greg is another of those episodes that highlights the best elements of Steven Universe. And the second worst Steven Universe episode is... Onion Gang. I tend to give Steven Universe a lot of credit for its main characters. To me, just about all the main cast are likeable, relatable, and entertaining. However, the minor character Onion. I honestly still have no idea what to make of this rotten kid. But maybe that's the whole point of him. He's basically nothing more than a silent menace, and there's really nothing that stands out about him. So imagine an episode that's just filled with knockoff onions. Minor, minor characters. Woohoo! It makes for about as interesting an episode as watching real onions grow. No, not even that. Watching plants can be beautiful and tranquil, and this episode certainly isn't beautiful or tranquil. Silent episodes can be done well, but Onion Gang is a stark reminder of what not to do. This episode adds nothing to the series other than reaffirming that Onion is weird. You could have gotten the message across that Steven needed more friends or needed to hang out with more people than just the Crystal Gems without creating a secret fighting club. In fact, other episodes like Joyride do that just fine. While the episode tries to add some charm to the Onion Gang and portray their way of fun as nothing more than different, it just felt dull to me and I feel like the episode is trying to force the audience to like these characters. A lot of the beauty of these scenes feels very artificial and ham-fisted, and many of their weirder activities just feel overly whimsical. All right, whoo! No more weirdo friends. Onion's friends are also mischievous and somewhat mean-spirited in many of their activities. I don't mind this, it just makes the episode seem incredibly out of place and almost like it doesn't belong in the show at all. That's a common problem with the Onion-centered episodes in general. I guess I can see Onion being more of an experimental character, to see if they can make a character that doesn't talk interesting, which I'm sure they could do. And while I can admire the attempt, it's safe to say that I definitely don't think it worked. To me, the emotional conflicts and dialogues are part of what makes Steven Universe so memorable. And, well, Onion has zero of that. And I think the second best Steven Universe episode is Rose's Scabbard. This was probably the first real time we saw that hidden side of Pearl. Her complex relationship with Rose was part of what made her, to me anyway, one of the most relatable characters in the show. It starts off with Pearl finding out that Steven's pet lion was kept secret from her, and it basically sets off a huge character conflict for her. But seeing as Pearl had talked about Steven's mother like a goddess for the whole series up to this point, it was a conflict I was able to empathize with. What do you know? You've never even met her! For me, this is a staple episode of the show. It's one of those episodes that the gut punch doesn't weaken over time, but instead gets stronger the more context we're given. Little did we know that this episode would be one of the most defining moments of the show, as well as give a sneak peek for where it was headed in terms of tone and subject material. Yeah, it's an episode that demonstrates just how three-dimensional all the main characters' relationships feel. The episode is special because it has more meaning if you watch it after the single Pale Rose reveal. We all knew from that episode alone that Pearl was in love with Rose, but giving more context to their relationship made it all the more upsetting. Even the words, my Pearl, have a completely different meaning after watching the big reveal. It's one of those rare instances where an episode gets better and more powerful over time and with more context, which is why I think that it's one of the best episodes of the show. It was very carefully written with the Rose Pink Diamond reveal in mind. And I think that's part of where Steven Universe excels. We've come to expect that almost everything we see matters in the show, and it tends to make me pay more attention to what's being shown to me. The Crooniverse was not afraid to cross a line that was very easy to mess up. If they executed this scene any other way, I don't think Pearl would be as well received as she is now. This was her first defining moment in the show, giving us a glimpse at how complex she is. Mental health challenges can be ugly, and it's so rare to see a show so unapologetic about portraying it realistically. Well, I think you're pretty great. <laughs> 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 
And before we get to number one, let's go through a few quick honorable mentions. Keystone Motel. After Pearl takes advantage of Garnet interfusing with her in Cry for Help, Garnet falls apart, with Ruby and Sapphire coping very differently with their turmoil and trauma, finding themselves split apart even further by that dissonance. This gives us an intriguing look at the psychology of Garnet, and we can see she has more complexity than we were previously shown. You know what's nice about being split up? What? I get to look at you. Last one out of Beach City. As we've said, Pearl's unrequited love for Rose is a major aspect of the series, and Pearl recovering from her grief is a big aspect of her character arc. And in this episode, we get a rather soft story about Pearl joining Amethyst and Steven on a trip to a punk rock show in an effort to show how cool she can be. What follows is a very interesting evening where Pearl makes a connection with a mysterious woman she has a crush on. It also has a nice message about there being different perceptions of cool. This episode's refreshing because its tone and feel are like nothing I've ever seen in the show since. The whole scenario of their night out and their exchanges are very relatable and down to earth. Sworn to the Sword. I think this episode teaches the importance of companionship and self-value. I'd say this is the first episode that I really started to see that strong bond between Connie and Steven. We're a team! She's the strawberry! And he's the biscuit! Can't Go Back. Can't Go Back is an episode that explores all the turmoil Lapis Lazuli has experienced. And this eventually culminates in Lapis deciding to run away for the third and final time which is a very powerful moment for the series. While I have mixed thoughts on Lapis's treatment of others, I think this is another great example of where the show shines, in simply offering a peaceful, insightful exchange between two characters on a moon base. What if the diamonds show up? What if something bad happens? Well, what if something good happens? <laughs> Reunited, part one. A very pleasant same-sex wedding episode between two well-loved main characters. And I'm glad to see it broke some new ground for the animation industry because of this wedding. It's a sweet, carefully crafted, and satisfying wedding. Without ever saying the word wife to skip over the more conservative and stupid insecure senses. Anyway, as for the dishonorable mentions, Kevin Party. While I admit this episode's probably a relatable scenario for many teenagers, I really don't think we need an episode centered around one of the most irritating and self-centered characters in the show, Kevin. If I can't be the coolest, I at least gotta be seen hanging with the coolest. Dewey wins. Just an uneventful romp of an upset Steven trying to help Dewey with an election. But eventually even Dewey admits he's a bad candidate, and I'm mostly left wondering why Steven is even helping him. I think Dewey gets a little more redeemable in this episode as he relents and gives the election to Nanafa, and Nanafa becoming the new mayor did feel earned and satisfying. I also like the revelation Steven has at the end. To me, it felt really relatable. I still feel betrayed. That's probably how Connie feels. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, but I've got to find a new job. Barn mates. Lapis has always had a lot to work through as a character, and she often has difficulty with impulse control, which does seem in line with her character, as a lack of impulse control can happen in PTSD. And the idea that Lapis has probably struggled with emotional growth and impulse control since her traumatic event does seem very evident in this episode. I don't want your garbage. She treats Peridot horribly here, and it's hard to forgive her character for just how cruel she acts. Overall, I just didn't enjoy this particular episode. But anyway, on to the number ones. And personally, I think the number one worst Steven Universe episode is... Escapism. Ugh. How do you take us from the edge of our seats for the second last episode of the season to complete and utter mind-numbing boredom? I mean, jeebus. The episode before this ended was Steven and Connie revealing they can fuse, the biggest taboo on Homeworld. They were thrown in jail shortly after witnessing the Crystal Gems get poofed. So after all that intensity and plot development, what do we get next? We get to watch the lives of those stupid, stupid watermelon Stevens. I can literally hear the story grinding and screeching to a halt from its runaway freight train pace. And honestly, does anyone actually find these things remotely cute or interesting? Yet alone cute enough to spend the entire second last episode of the season finale dealing with them? 
Hmm. I know that this episode is agreed upon by many to be among the worst, but I'm going to play devil's advocate here and disagree. Huh. Really? Yeah. In fact, I think this episode was far from the worst. I consider it the calm before the storm. And considering Change Your Mind was the next episode and Together Alone was directly before it, I think it was a well-needed break from all the action. Well, I can certainly agree that it was a calm. And I don't mind the calm. In fact, the island setting is among my favorite settings. But personally, to me anyway. Nothing about the story, characters, or settings felt important. Even when Steven is put in peril, there's not one second where I care, because I know he's gonna be fine. I actually found the character and setting very interesting. I felt that this episode had a lot of strong symbolism. There were the peaceful watermelons, and there were also the violent watermelons. These two tribes were meant to be symbolism for the pacifist and bellicist ideologies. Those are interesting observations. I get where you're coming from there. But personally, I just hate the watermelon Stevens. They remind me of one of those stupid, precious Disney characters from the 60s. And even when they're playing around in their cutesy society, I just feel completely uninvested watching them. The episode plays Steven's danger so chipper, and the longer it goes, the less of a point there seems to be to it. The show has always been about if peace and love can vanquish all, or if sometimes you need to take a violent approach to stop evil. This symbolism was happening right before the big fight with White Diamond, because Steven was ultimately going to need to choose one way or the other in order to defeat her. That, or he would have needed to use a combination of the two ideologies, which was shown at the end of the episode by both tribes working together to get Steven off of the island. I think if I'd also got that message from it, I would have been much more tolerant of it. But personally, watching the episode myself, I didn't perceive anything on the show's contrast between those two ideologies. In fact, I generally felt the fifth season swayed way too much towards peace, diplomacy, and tolerance solving everything. Well, I don't think that the episode could have come at a better time, and I think the main reason people dislike it so much is because they were impatient to get to the much-anticipated fight between Steven and the Diamonds. Although I think that is an element of the viewer's reaction, I personally don't believe that was a sole reason for the bad reaction. If, for example, I got a filler episode about Lars or Sadie's personal lives instead of this, maybe somehow related to Steven communicating with them? Even if it was slow and boring, I would have been okay with that. Sure, it still would have been a jarring break from the action, but at least I'm invested and interested in those characters. But I just don't give two hoots about cutesy watermelons. After so much intensity and character development and the overall quality of the fifth season, to suddenly shovel in an episode that feels like an early season one reject, it just felt very jarring. Well, as a standalone episode, I certainly don't consider it to be the worst of the show. Well, I respect your opinion, Leah, and I appreciate hearing your unique perspective on the episode and what you got out of it. What would you personally pick as your least favorite episode? I think my least favorite would probably be Onion Gang, which we mentioned earlier. Well, I think that's a great choice too. Anyway, on to the best. And personally, I think the number one best Steven Universe episode is The Trial, Off Colors, and Lars's Head. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't choose between these three. Like the Crystal Gems themselves, I feel like these three are at their best when they watch together. The trial delves into what happened between Rose and Pink Diamond, and it results in one of the most shocking endings from the show, but also gives us a good feel for the ruthlessness of Homeworld. There is still a real sense of peril and terror at this point. The Diamonds are still the mass genocide committing fascist evil beings they began as. Until, apparently, all the Nazi equivalents needed was to be talked to and have a freaking ball with their sister. Yeah, I'm sure Hitler totally would have been into that. Off Colors gives us a glimpse into the lives and minds of the outcast gems, and it really captures the struggles of oppression, and I believe it even brushes on the difficulties of being born with disabilities. The Off Color gems are beautifully represented, they're shown to be real people, and this is one of the best portrayals of disabilities I've ever seen in cartoons. And it also shines a light on their personal strengths. And Off Colors and Lars' head took the final step in turning one of the most obnoxious characters in the show to one of the strongest and likable minor characters. Throughout these episodes, we see so much more growth and relatability from Lars. The fear, the beautiful, elegantly shown message the terror-inducing soundtrack of mystery. Lars, it's okay to be afraid. Even the action's fantastic. The fact that Lars's fear and fragility is shown 
and him conquering that fear and his physical fragility. It's just such an amazing demonstration of his humanity. It also includes what I consider one of the most beautiful but heartbreaking sacrifices in the show. And the resurrection itself is so perfectly timed and so powerful. Damn this scene, this scene and the exchange after, it's, it's probably my favorite moment in the entire show. Whether it be in books or movies or animation, resurrection moments can be so powerful. I think if they're done right, and that's a big if, they can break through and create some of the most impossibly powerful and emotional moments in all of entertainment. We can feel the heaviness and terror of their situation, of their surroundings, yet there's still such profoundness to what we are learning throughout it. The gripping trial, the looming mystery of Rose, and the harshness and terror of the diamonds. Running in terror as fugitives within the heart of a foreign, unknown galaxy. Death and rebirth. Character revelations. There is so much about these three episodes that hits me. I apologize for bending the rules, but I personally consider these three episodes together the best Steven Universe episodes of all. Hmm. While I agree that all of these episodes are fantastic, I would definitely consider episode like Rose's Scabbard better. Yeah, and I can definitely understand you preferring Rose's Scabbard. I just personally found these episodes so profound, so eye-opening, so emotional, atmospheric, and revelating that I couldn't not put them at number one. I realize I'm pretty biased on this. How about you, Leah? Did you have a favorite of these three? I'd say my favorite of the three is The Trial, simply because I think it portrays Steven's early relationship with the Crystal Gems perfectly, and even to an extent his relationship with them up until the end of Season 5. He's always withholding the truth from them to not hurt their feelings, even when his feelings take a blow as a result. And I think that this episode showed the first instance of that maturity and sacrifice coming through. That's a good point. Though Steven is severely chewed out for his sacrificial behavior later on, and I'm mixed on that. So what's your number one favorite episode, Leah? My favorite episode is still Rose's Scabbard, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. If I had to choose an episode with no bias, however, I would have to say that my best episode is tied between Change Your Mind and Reunited. Both of these episodes have a little bit of everything that makes the show great and unique. They both have musical numbers, action, symbolism, lore, progressive themes, and emotional moments in them. Whether or not these are the only episodes that you watch, or you're watching the series as a whole, they're good and entertaining by themselves. You may be lost on what the story is if you were to watch these by themselves, but it would give you the best representation of what the show is about and what it stands for. That's why I personally think that Change Your Mind and Reunited are tied for number one. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and I respect your opinion. I appreciate you contributing your own personal favorites, Leah. Hopefully viewers can find some of their own favorites in the episodes we've talked about. But anyway, when it comes to writing, it's essential to experiment to stay fresh, and sometimes those experiments don't always work. And I hope I never fault the amazing Steven Universe team for trying to experiment. Over the last few years, this show's brought me so much emotional investment, and even some moments of personal insight. When it comes to companionship, interpersonal connections, and so many emotionally powerful factors, Steven Universe has so often delivered. And most of the worst episodes do indeed feel pretty experimental. And as Leah and I demonstrated, what I consider the worst episode, she considers fine. And bad can indeed be very subjective. And thank you for your assistance, Leah. It was a pleasure to have your perspective and informed opinion on the show. No problem, Strider. Thanks for having me on the show. If viewers would like to check out my own Steven Universe videos, they can find them over on Toon Runes. I'll leave a link here. And as always, thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time. Got room for three more? Always. Nice night, isn't it? Yeah.